and say welcome everyone to our uh, uh, weekly Monday morning or mon Monday, Monday, not Monday morning, uh, Monday call. Uh, great to see you all uh, on the call. I uh, hope you've had a, a fantastic uh, weekend. Um, let me just share my slide momentarily. Um, and say, uh, as you're hopefully all, all aware, the uh, main thrust of our call this week will be talking about uh, zero DNS um, towards better zero trust security using DNS, which uh, um, uh, Levy will come on and talk about uh, uh, in a moment. Um, and then, as always, I just touch on a few uh, recent developments and uh, mention some sort of forthcoming events and uh, uh, any impending uh, milestones for things like uh, um, early bird rates, uh, etc. Uh, remind you future call topics, um, and we'll certainly have a chance for any other business um, uh, along the way. Um, and as always, if anyone's got any questions, uh, pop them in the chat, um, or as we're going through, use the Zoom tool to uh, raise your virtual hand, uh, and I will come to you um, through either of those um, methods. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's uh, all, all the uh, formalities. So um, if before, uh, let me just uh, introduce uh, Levy, who's uh, kindly agreed to uh, join us. Um, uh, he, he shared a paper uh, that he had recently uh, co-authored um, uh, uh, and that was, uh, uh, I think at an event, it was certainly in a journal um, at the very end of last year. Um, and in the uh, uh, call reminder, uh, you uh, will have seen a link to uh, the uh, paper. Uh, so, um, as it's sort of DNS orientated, uh, I, I asked uh, Levy if he'd like to uh, join us, which he's agreed to do, just really to talk through some of the highlights, uh, and then hopefully that will lead to uh, a, a good discussion, um, a bit of a Q&A and, &A and uh, a general discussion on some of the points uh, arising, because zero trust is certainly um, very much uh, a topic of the moment. So with, without further ado, let me hand over to uh, uh, Levy, who will uh, uh, sort of take over, uh, sort of share his slides, uh, which will be available. I'll circulate those afterwards for people to uh, peruse at your leisure. Um, so Levy, um, thanks for joining. Over to you. Uh, look forward to what I think will be a very interesting presentation. Okay. Uh, hi and welcome, everyone. I see. I hope I was able to share my screen. Uh, do you see my screen? Do you see my slides? Yep. All uh, slides are clear. Sounds clear as well, uh, Levy. Okay. So thanks, Andrew, for the invitation and the quick introduction. Uh, I promise to be here with all my co-authors, or at least one of the co-authors. But please bear with me because uh, here is already tomorrow uh, in, in Singapore, so they have a, a meeting in the morning. So. You have to put up with me only uh, this time. Um, yeah, and as, as Andrew mentioned, I, I like to talk about a research pa recent paper that was published to a security conference uh, back in December, a couple of months ago. And uh, basically just a quick introduction of myself. So some of you might have known me from a previous uh, op uh, opportunity when I was uh, presenting here uh, on this um, call. So, I'm now working for the Agency for Science, Technology, and Research. This is called ASTAR in Singapore. This is basically a, a national research agency in Singapore, and it somehow bridges the gap between academia and the and in industry. So I guess uh, every nation and, and country has a similar kind of national or government-funded uh, institute somewhere in between the universities and, and the industry. So ASTAR is the one for Singapore. Uh, I'm a researcher there. And my main domain is basically software-defined networking and also network security. And nowadays, I started to focus on zero trust uh, and all the encrypted protocols that I also usually follow what you guys are uh, talking about the channel, but I'm also interested in other, a lot of other aspects of those uh, protocols. And uh, my work regarding uh, encrypted DNS-related research was first presented here, I think, in 2021 uh, or Right there, yes, Andrew can confirm it, but I think it was 2021. And it was a paper when uh, DNS over HTTPS was uh, kind of like a big hype uh, as a new hype that time. 
And uh, my research at that time was focusing on whether it is possible to distinguish those DNS over HTTPS packets from the encrypted web traffic. That was a pure machine learning kind of approach. So this time I will also talk about something else uh, than, than machine learning. So what is the reason why I'm here? So basically I also mentioned uh, quickly to Andrew in the beginning. So my main name is not really about telling what I did and mainly about uh, trying to get some input from you guys. So the things that we have tried to do in, in this research uh, is that we formulated two main questions that we investigated. One of them was, can we provide a strong authentication or authorization to the DNS infrastructure itself to make it zero trust ready? And of course, I will also talk about later all the, all the terms that I'm using. It's just now a, a quick summary. Uh, and then the second question I would like to get some feedback for is that can we use the DNS infrastructure for something else, especially in this case, to convey some other zero trust related control information by using DNS. Because uh, basically the, the, our main work and also the questions were inspired by some other research works. One of them was called software resolved networks, where the researchers were using IPv6 segment routing information to be conveyed by DNS to the endpoints. So the endpoints could have optimized their routing based on the segment routing and all the information was conveyed using the DNS itself. So this information is totally orthogonal to the DNS itself. Uh, the other thing which also inspired our work is a recent DNS HTTPS resource record, which is also now as almost like, a, I think it's standardized already. So it's a standardized resource record and it's usually used nowadays to convey like the encrypted client hello public case uh, for TLS 1.3 and, and ECH. And also it is it is used to, to, to convey some application layer uh, protocol uh, negotiation information like uh, you can get, uh, for instance, that whether a web service supports HTTP tree like quick traffic directly from the DNS. So you don't have to do a lot of round trips with TCP, TLS and, and things like that. So we just try to look into that, what else we can use DNS for. Uh, so let me have a quick introduction about the zero trust uh, paradigm at all, or at least how we see it. Because to me, uh, zero trust is also something like 5G. Everybody has its own perception about what 5G means, but they never are they are never aligned with, with each other. So just quickly today, the typical security model of an organization is still this kind of like old school parameter based approach, which is quite similar to this medieval castle that you can see on my slides. So there's a parameter which is strongly guarded and everything inside the parameter is considered as a safe environment. And of course, outside is super dangerous. So basically there's no access uh, from outside unless you authenticate yourself or you basically browse one of the publicly exposed services like a web server or something. Uh, and once you have a full access uh, inside the parameter, then you can have basically full access to everything. And of course there is a severe flaw in this. We all know this because once that perimeter is breached, then this little ninja guy can basically go in and move uh, freely, laterally access or even leak sensitive data. Um, the digital transformation, on the other hand, has made the traditional perimeter-based network defense quite obsolete. Because in particular, the problem is that today's digital estates typically consists of services and endpoints managed by public cloud providers. Uh, or even connected through out of control networks that we don't have access to, like even mobile movement. And some of the devices are also owned by employees, partners, and customers that the traditional perimeter based model was never built to protect. So now we have, especially after COVID, right, we have all these bring your own devices kind of uh, methods in an enterprise. So many of the devices we even bring into the, to the, to the enterprise is not owned by the enterprise, is not monitored by the enterprise itself. So obviously, because the perimeter itself is getting blurred, um, constantly changing because sometimes you're outside of your uh, enterprise, sometimes you're inside, sometimes you're working from home, sometimes you don't. Uh, so it's quite difficult to define. Uh, and the internal network itself is not safe anymore just because of a very simple fact, there is no such thing as internal network anymore. So what is zero trust? Uh, zero trust is something that, I mean, this kind of term has become one of the cybersecurity's latest buzzwords. It was like the 5G and the telecommunications, or it was like DNS or HTTPS in the DNS realm. So it was first specified in Google's Beyond Corp initiative back in 2014. And its main aim is just to remove this sort of implicit trust from the network 
by telling an organization to view its own network as a hostile environment, no matter what. So its specific meaning, however, as I tried to mention uh, before, can be rather convoluted. So some define it as an architecture, while others might see it as a suite or, uh, I mean, a suite of products or tools. So you can never be sure, but there is one thing that we usually uh, know about Zero Trust is that uh, if I look up the, the NIST guy's um, definition of Zero Trust, what you can basically see is, I hope you can see also my pointer, but the main uh, thing with Zero Trust is that basically you are here with the system and anytime you want to access an enterprise resource, first you have to go to an authentication phase. And the authentication phase is something called the policy decision point. It's up in the control plane. So first you, you, you try to communicate with the policy decision point. And according to the policy engine, your credentials are being checked. And it's a very fine grain uh, check basically. So whether you have, you can access a service, what service you can access and what kind of credentials you have and what are your roles? Uh, can you just read or also write a database for instance? So it can be a very fine grained thing. And once you are uh, authorized yourself to the zero trust control plane, then you become basically physically available to actually access that enterprise resource that you want to have. Want to have. And this is enforced in the data plane by the so-called elements like policy enforcement point. So you can think about it that every time you go to the control plane, you authenticate yourself. And if you are authorized, then the control plane communicates with these policy enforcement enforcement points in the data plane, which lets you connect to the server. And then it also provides you the authentication tokens or authorization tokens or whatever that would be needed to, to communicate with that specific service. To basically reach this point, zero trust is building on three main pillars. Uh, one of them is a strong authentication, which is usually just using client certificates like MTLS. Uh, the, sec the second one is a strong authorization, which I was just talking about. It's a very fine grain access control. And of course, we are living in a world of encryption. So we just want strong encryptions for zero trust as well. So basically you can say that these three pillars are most important things for zero trust. Uh, and uh, this is how essentially these whole architecture we work. And there are also several companies already who embrace the CT architecture, I would say, but all of them are approached differently and they already sell some of the products they, they now have to outsource your zero trust to Cloudflare, for instance. They have Cloudflare also have uh, such a solution and Google, Microsoft also have their own. So this is, even though it's quite new, there are still some companies who are providing some sort of a, of, uh, of a zero trust uh, control plane for your company. So what is, what is that we were thinking of and what we were doing in this paper is that we try to formalize, uh, I mean, we not even try, let's say we identify three main practical issues regarding the deployment of zero trust. The one of the, the, the most important thing is that these extra authorizations require new entities in the network. So default routes might be affected, traffic engineering might be required because the central control plane entity is at a as a segregated part of the network or just physically located somewhere in your network that might uh, impose some traffic engineering. And that new entity can also be simply a bottleneck or even a victim of a denial service attack. And from a practical point of view, just let's be honest, it's just a yet another server no one wants to maintain. It's a yet, an, yet another set of traffic no one really wants to monitor. No one really wants to write the Wireshark plugin for it. And it's just a, another new set of logs that we don't want to parse. So there is one like a management uh, burden of introducing zero trust to your enterprise. The second one is that I think we all know this from the DNS encrypted point of view, DNS, I mean, the DOH and, and all these things that if we increase the security, there's always a trade-off. We increase the number of components or the layers involved. So which eventually, at least in the zero trust thing because of the additional control plane, it ends up of having more round trips, which eventually leads to an increased communication overhead which at the end results in that the time to first byte is going to be increased. This is a, I think this is probably a cliche now, but it's just a, a typical trade of that when we are increasing security, what we have to deal with. And third and most important, and this is where DNS comes into the picture, is that the DNS infrastructure itself is always left intact. So even, even we are talking about DT, uh, DOT, DOH, which are already standardized since 2016 and 2018 respectively, even in, in, in many enterprises, it is still unsecured by default. And, and the thing what I can think of is probably you guys also have a different point of view because you're also working for enterprises and in this industry. But what I've seen is that it's just so critical role that none of the network operators 
uh, are actually fine with touching it. So they are just quite reluctant to interfere with DNS because once you screw up anything in a DNS config that you basically screw up the whole network at some point. So it's, it's, it's better to not touch it. And on the other hand, there is a, there's a new way of thinking about zero trust that the zero trust itself obsoletes the need uh, and the architecture point of view of VPNs because VPNs are from the perimeter-based approach, right? So by VPN, we are logically connecting ourselves to the perimeter. But once we, we have this zero trust paradigm and we always authenticate and authorize, we don't need VPN at all. What would that impose in the future is that all the internal domains that now we have within the environment, they have to be exposed because if there's no VPN and I want to reach my uh, internal resources through my regular internet connection from home, then I somehow need to communicate to my company's DNS resolver and resolve, let's say, the HR portal dot whatever company that comes. Uh, and of course, that would also expose the enterprise's DNS resolver, which can be a threat because within the within your enterprise, you are probably less uh, affected by any denial service attack. But once you expose your DNS, any kind of network reconnaissance attack, you can be a victim of or any further or more sophisticated denial service attack. So eventually you would need to protect the enterprise uh, DNS from abuse. And the way how we try to address this problem is that we propose zero DNS. So zero DNS has nothing to do with a network without DNS. So it's a, it's a compound word, but it's coming from the zero trust word and the DNS infrastructure. So uh, bear with me, this might be not the best name, uh, but it was published as this way. So I just stick to the naming convention we introduced, but it's it's still, we still have DNS. Okay, that was, that, that, is, the, that is the main reason now with, uh, of, of myself being here. So, so first to solve the third issue, uh, with zero DNS, we try to provide a strong authentication and authorization and encryption to the existing DNS infrastructure as a reverse proxy plugin that terminates all TLS and MTLS connections. So hence, the original DNS infrastructure can remain intact and does not have to be aware of any of these additions. So one of our main aim is that if I want to sell something to someone who doesn't want to touch the DNS server, then I don't want them to touch the DNS server. So that's one of the main. So you probably anyway use a, a load balancer for, uh, I mean, a reverse proxy or something similar for load balancing issues or even uh, deal with any other kind of attacks or, or just serve your uh, clients as fast as possible. Uh, so what we are trying to do is to provide an extra plugin to that, which can encrypt and also provide all these kind of encryption methods for your DNS backend servers. The, the way how we try to minimize the extra authorizations that are required by new entities is that the zero trust control plane traffic, we want to realize it in the DNS. So this is where one of our second question comes in when I mentioned at the beginning that can we use the DNS traffic to convey the zero trust related control plane information? Because uh, no matter what network you own or no matter what how you connect to the internet, everything starts with the DNS, right? This is this is not all we know. So DNS is anyway something that you cannot avoid. So why not use it to convey more information than it can? It might be a, sounds like abusing DNS for this purpose, but this is one of the one of the question or, or one of the approach we we try to use here, use here. And of course, by piggybacking those DNS packets, uh, we can significantly reduce the group by a number of round trips. Uh, because with the zero trust network and the control plane, you would have a lot of new round trips to just authorize yourself. And then you would anyway do the DNS and then you would connect to the server. So if you anyway do the DNS, then why not put the zero trust control plane into the DNS traffic? And then you can reduce the number of round trips, which means that your time to first byte uh, can be decreased. So the aim is somewhere to, to play around with this trade-off with the increased security and the, the connection time. And the architecture is, is, is quite simple. So I, I don't really want to go into all details, but what you can see here is uh, that, uh, so we implemented zero DNS on top of the Nginx. So by using Nginx JavaScript. So Nginx is not only a simple software you can also configure. It provides a programming interface in JavaScript. It's not a pure JavaScript, it's an Nginx JavaScript, but it's more or less the same at some point. Uh, so, we programmed uh, an Nginx plugin. So now this whole Nginx system serves as a load balancer with some extra benefits. And as can be seen, the DNS servers are left intact on the left-hand side. So I don't want to touch DNS. I don't want to provide DOT or DOH endpoints for, let's say, by nine. I don't want to touch any of the existing DNS infrastructure. 
the nginx plugin is the one that provides the encrypted dns endpoints for them so it's on the on the right hand side so the nginx can provide a dns over https entry for your uh, for your dns servers or a dns over tls uh, entry and once a user basically wants to resolve a domain in this zero dns architecture then first its mtls certificate is checked so all the clients who are authorized and are allowed to resolve domain names they are served by client certificates uh, with MTLS. So if a user connect, wants to resolve a domain, then the MTLS certificate is first checked. And if it is correct, then the DNS query is forwarded to the DNS backend server. So your queries are coming in here, and then your query is just forwarded to the backend servers. And at meanwhile, while your backend servers are looking up the DNS or the domain name itself, then the policy engine here uh, checks the user credentials against the policy defined by the policy admin. So if a user is allowed to resolve a domain name, then the original DNS response will not be dropped. Uh, but eventually, if you wouldn't be uh, allowed to resolve a domain, then your responses that would come back from the backend servers would be dropped. So for instance, if a user, I mean, if we just think it further, if a user is also allowed to connect to an enterprise resource, then the corresponding authorization and authentication tokens are basically added to the DNS response as a text record in this case. So the DNS servers are still left intact, so they just send back the original response. The policy engine decides whether we can basically let that uh, DNS response to go through. If if uh, if you authenticate it yourself, the, the DNS response can go through. And of course, if you are also allowed to communicate with the servers, then the DNS response will be extended or modified uh, on the fly by this green box in the middle uh, without having the original DNS servers be aware of that. Um, and if a user has no proper MTLS certificate, of course, then everything just uh, terminated here. So if you're, if you're just a regular botnet or some outsider of the of the company, all your queries will be dropped straight away by the load balancer. So your DNS servers, back, DNS backend servers are uh, are considered to be safe. And last but not least, if a user has a proper MTLS certificate uh, and also allowed to resolve a domain name, but no tokens are available, like no authentication tokens, then the DNS response will be uh, transferred as it is uh, by default. So this is made more like a fallback mechanism. So if, if everything uh, works, in this case, everything works the same as uh, as normal. So let's let's uh, show you an example. Uh, so this is a, a simple dig query that we usually see many times probably in a terminal. So the domain now I'm resolving is mtlsdns.com. And the answer is that I have the IP address here. So this is, this is how normally DNS works. So once you uh, authenticate yourself and you're also authorized to access this domain, mtlsdns.com, which for this uh, example is basically a, a web service uh, that you would anyway access as an enterprise resource, then the response looks like this. So the answer is the same, just that the plugin itself uh, on, the, on the load balancer that we implemented, which is the zero DNS plugin, is just do the lookup for your credentials in the policy database. And then accordingly, it extends the original DNS response with the token related information. Now you can see that we just use a text record here and put everything inside the text record. And even if a DNS text record has a limitation of 255 characters, we can create just a new text record. And by providing uh, easy, to, uh, easy to find kind of separators like this kind, the GWT colon, colon, colon can be an indicator of having GW tokens as authorization tokens. And uh, that can be also the separator for tokens if there are more than one tokens. Uh, and the thing is that since the, the arbitrary extension is possible basically to any response. So since the zero trust tokens or the zero trust control plane at some point and the DNS infrastructure are totally independent ent entities in this scenario because the plugin is the one, the zero DNS plugin is the one that, that put these things together. Uh, you can basically use zero DNS to also append some sort of authorization or authentication tokens to any DNS response. So you are not tied to your uh, your own domain. If, if one of your services or something is running outside of your enterprise, let's say you run it in Cloudflare or Google, where well, you want to provide these kind of authorization tokens in your own, you can also do it because the domain and then the token uh, handling part are not done by one entity. So they can always be uh, mix and match, I would say. Uh, 
And we evaluated this kind of the zero DNS performance uh, because as you know, it, it kind of like inherently imposes additional processing overhead. So we tried to cope with the the, the overhead of the security uh, and the round trips, but now we kind of cutting those off, but still now we, we do extra processing because of, of this readiness plugin itself. So if this extra processing would be much more than doing handshakes and the round trips for the zero trust control plane, then of course there is nothing much to gain. So what we try to do here is to evaluate whether, at least from a performance point of view, whether it makes sense to do this. And for this, we just use a simple containerized environment. So I know it's not really the, the biggest enterprise scenario. So everything is kind of like virtualized. Uh, and we use the KDIG utility, which is uh, similar to DIG utility we all use normally for, for testing our DNS servers. But the thing is that KDIG is uh, supporting MTLS. So by KDIG, I can also set my client certificate. And this is the reason why we use KDIG. Uh, so we can see that, uh, I mean, here are the results at some point. So the baseline we are comparing our, our latency increases the the typically UDP unencrypted DNS, uh, that's that's zero. Everything uh, on top is basically an addition to the latency. So we can see here that obviously using TCP instead of UDP uh, already involves a slight increase, right? It's not a surprise just because of the TCP handshake. And furthermore, if we just look the other res results that every time when there is this read proxy label uh, and basically everything else, which is not TCP, it means that the, uh, the reverse proxy is in action. And even if the, the tokens are not added to any of the responses, there are still some code execution. Code execution means that once your MTLS certificate uh, is accepted and your DNS query is processed, it means your, your query is indeed processed. So we parse the DNS packets, we see the details, what domains you want to resolve, and then I, I let then we let those packets to go to the backend servers, but at the same time we check whether you are you have any authorization tokens and so on. So we are basically always parsing the DNS packets in that sense, which would already impose some kind of computational overhead. But eventually, what we all see is that even if we just have the DOT endpoint, so the DNS over TLS endpoint. So if we just provide a DNS over TLS endpoint for our regular DNS backend server through an nginx proxy. Uh, it already imposes a quite negligible uh, extra latency around 0 0.3 milliseconds. Uh, this is on the fourth bar here. Uh, I'm still not sure whether you see my pointer, but I, I assume that you might see it. And then on the fourth column, what you can see is that uh, in this case, the DNS packets were not even just parsed, but they were also extended by the tokens. And you can see that even if that thing is, is taking place, the, the increase is, is negligible in the average latency. So this is something that proved us that at some point in this uh, small uh, kind of like restricted environment, we don't see uh, much um, increase in the latency. Of course, this is a simple scenario when there is one client uh, which sends 100 consecutive queries to the DNS servers in a row. So it's kind of like an ideal environment. Uh, so maybe it's just the baseline again. Uh, but at least the initial results are uh, quite promising. And for some reason, I don't know whether anyone wants to do this, but I was quite surprised that when I employed the NS over HTTPS endpoint through the Nginx proxy, then the average latency increased quite well. I think just because the Nginx proxy, how it does it, you, you basically have to convert all the HTTPS JSON uh, format to the DNS wire format. So just because of that conversion, uh, if you employ DNS over HTTPS endpoint to the Nginx proxy, then it already increases like around one millisecond additional latency, at least in this environment. So it's it's better to use DOT at least. Uh, and even for the DOH use case, you can also see that even if you want to manipulate the, the responses by extending it with the authorization tokens, it also involves uh, a, a more uh, visible um, overhead. So just to quickly drop into the conclusion, so we have been talking about a traditional perimeter-based network security model, which is obsolete, because nowadays it's quite hard to define the perimeter, and we cannot assume anymore that everything is inside and everything is safe, because there is no such thing anymore as internal network. And this new zero trust paradigm uh, kind of like removes this implicit trust from the network by having this philosophy of uh, never trust, always verify. 
And of course, because of this, we have to deal with the typical security trade-off. So we have a better security, we have more layers, and we have an impact of speed. And especially if I would introduce all the 5G-related buzzwords to this topic about ultra-low latency and all these latency-critical applications, that would even make more sense. So how do you how will you protect your future IoT 5G environment uh, if they are really requiring low latency, if by the increased security you would introduce actually extra latency? So then to overcome these kind of things, we introduce zero DNS, uh, at least not overcome all the issues with zero trust, but at least three main practical issues that we identified. So we extend the zero trust principles through critical DNS infrastructure, which is, I mean, if you have ever done anything with, with Nginx and all these TLS offloading, then you would know that basically providing MTLS to DNS is not a big deal. Just probably not many people uh, are doing it, but within Nginx, you can do it after issuing the certificate with a couple of lines of codes. It's more like a configuration, not even, not even coding. Uh, the second thing is that we uploaded these zero trust control plane functions to the DNS. So all these tokens that the zero trust control plane would provide to the users are now distributed via DNS. And third, uh, by doing this, we can basically reduce the number of networking elements inside the network. So which inherently means we are also reducing the number of round trips you have to make so we reduce the time to first byte at the end. Uh, and as the measurements indicated, even though it was a small measurement, that still uh, less than 0 0.3 millisecond additional computational latency was observed if we are using DNS over TLS offloading feature of the Nginx uh, load balancer. And if, uh, if Nginx is deployed already, then you can consider it zero, right? Because uh, that you anyway have the load balancer, which would and we have to do some uh, packet parsing at least to define uh, whatever load balancing uh, logic or algorithm from the packet headers itself. And then according to that, there is only 30 uh, microseconds additional latency uh, to, the, to the regular uh, access. And uh, for some reason, as I mentioned, for the DNS over HTTPS involves a little bit more processing, but I think it's still doable uh, and it still doesn't impact that much uh, the, the, the whole um, latency problem. And one last slide uh, that what is the feedback or what are the feedback we are actually interested in? So after talking about all these zero DNS stuff, so besides the zero trust principle, do you think that is it or will be there a need for a strong authentication and authorization for the DNS infrastructure? Because we're all talking about encrypted DNS, but we are always thinking about just DNS over TLS by encrypting the communications and let the server to, to prove uh, that it's the server we want to talk with, right? But the clients were never authenticated. So it's, in short, do you think that does it make sense at all to add MTLS to DNS itself or, or it's, a, it's, it's a dumb idea? The, the second idea is more related to, to, to the way how we uh, did what we wanted is that is the idea of using DNS for other than DNS purposes acceptable? Let's say if we, can this kind of approach that I'm talking now proposes a new, like a DNS resource record for zero trust, uh, if there is also a HTTPS resource record for any other purposes. So these are the things that I, I'm, I'm actually trying to, you know, as, as a food for thought at the end, uh, this, is the, this is the main takeaway basically uh, of, of my presentation. Uh, and with that, I just wanna thank you for, for listening. Uh, if there's any question, please, uh, just pointed at me. And now I give it back to you, uh, Andrew. Okay, that's great. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Levy. An interesting uh, presentation as always. And I did check and but just by, as an aside, your, your previous presentation, I put a link in the chat, uh, was nearly 18 months ago. Um, I thought oh. it was only uh, maybe six months or maybe nine months, but uh, 18 months, uh, September 2021, uh, surprisingly. Oh. Uh, Anyway, there's a lot of good ground uh, that, that, that you covered there. I'm confident that uh, Peter Lowe will be uh, very positive to add uh, this uh, as another example of uh, other uses of the DNS to his Rule 53 presentation from, from uh, last week. So I'm sure he's uh, very grateful to have uh, that uh, added to his ever expanding list of uh, additional uses for the uh, DNS. Uh, as you were talking, I saw in the chat, I think think it's fair to say uh, Boris, I believe, is, is a tad sceptical about the whole zero, zero trust concept from his comments. Um, 
Chris, uh, I think, was questioning whether necessarily increased security leads to increased round trips. Um, and it's your, he referenced quick uh, as perhaps a way to not go need to get the round the additional round trips, which I suppose leads me to think about uh, DNS over quick as uh, maybe more beneficial than uh, than than, than Doe. I think there was a question about HTTP2 or it was it HTTP2 or HTTP3. Um, but in, so so first question was HTTP2 or HTTP3 um, and from, from Chris Box and second question from Tony Talbot was uh, will this work through third party resolvers? So maybe start with those and then see what other questions people have. And anyone with a question, either pop it in the chat as Chris and Tony have, or Tony, just use the Zoom facility to raise your virtual hand and you can sort of come on and have a conversation yeah, in, in real time. But but maybe start with those though. Uh, uh, sure, uh, sure. Okay. I, I, I perceive basically Chris question is not a question for me. It's basically a question as a as a comment that better we consider HTTP two or three in this whole realm regarding the 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 increase in the latency. Uh so if if it's if this is not the question, I mean what do you mean by is it HTTP two or three? Because uh now I just use a web service as an example and using GW tokens as an example, but it's not the whole zero trust principle in that that term or in that sense is not restricted to HTTP. It's just one specific uh, way of of talking about clients and servers uh, trying to communicate, and it's the easiest way to perceive. Uh, but there is no dependency on HTTP two or three. Uh, because it can be any protocol. If you refer yeah, I to- Yeah, I understand that. So I was, I was just, um, it's because you were presenting the performance results and the increased um, response time that you get through DOE. Um, and it, when you were me measuring those, was it HTTP version two? Oh, that was, yeah, pure HTTP two. I was not yeah, considering okay. any HTTP three or even DNS over quick. Okay, uh, yeah, the, thanks. The, the, the similar comment you you made, uh, the quick working group would say, this is not always true. Yeah, I totally agree with that because that's the aim of quick. Uh, but it's again for, for web access at, at this time. So uh, we try to look for a broader thing, uh, not just uh, HTTP web services, but it's a, it's a valid point. The, sorry, what was the second question from Tony, right? Uh, yeah, it was, will, will this work through third party uh, resolvers? Uh, yeah, actually, this is what I tried to convey in the in the in the slide where I was showing the dig uh, outputs. So, uh, if if I understand the question correctly, uh, so just let me let me reiterate through the question. So, through third party resolve. So, third party resolve means that I'm the uh, I'm the enterprise. Uh, I have. The, the authoritative DNS server, and I also okay. have the, the uh, authentication tokens while I... Oh, and then... So, well, uh, sorry, uh, maybe I should clarify. So a uh, user is at home, an enterprise user is at home or traveling or wherever, and they're using whatever resolver comes through their mm -hmm. uh, no, DHCP. Then it, then it wouldn't work because the thing is that these authorization tokens shouldn't be cached by any outside resolvers. So if you are right. traveling... I would, I would assume that you let's say you configure Cloudflare and what night for your name servers, but you also configure your third name yes, server so as your company's name server. server. So then eventually your query will probably so thing, uh, yes, find its way to to the right body. But maybe it so would have to fail the other ones first. Uh, yeah. So in that sense, it would impose extra latency again, right? This is yeah. one of one of the point that we can make. Uh, yeah, but. Yeah, I mean, also, uh, in my mind, I'm not an expert on zero trust, I'm really not a super expert on DNS. I mean, I think I understand it okay. But, uh, you know, it's it, it you still then have to trust that the client configuration is correct in some way. You know, it has this property of of using the, uh, the uh, company resolvers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is something so, we can uh, we assume that if you yeah. if oh, your so company your customer can okay. enable a VPN, uh, then oh, it's somewhat similar in terms of taxi limits, I would say. Right. So you still have to have some 
the you know client side pre qualification as it were. Exactly. You know? Yeah, some sort of provisioning or or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I'm I'm not sure you know where the practice is on all that. Uh, you know what the different enterprises may vary on what their requirements are and how they do it. But yeah, I mean, to me, zero trust means like really you could sort of sit down at an internet cafe if far across the world or something. I, I mean, that's probably not practically really, a, you know, the way we'd like to do it, but uh, I understand just, just replacing VPN with this, uh, right, might be a better uh, comparator. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so was there any other question that I haven't addressed yet? So there's nothing else in in the in the chat. So let me just see. Uh, anybody else have any uh, immediate questions um, to pose to uh, uh, Levy? Um, give you a chance just to uh, again either pop them in the chat or um, just raise your your virtual hand and and come off mute to uh, to to uh, sort of bring them in. Yeah, I'm happy to hear any comment on just, you know, using DNS for whatever purposes, just, you know, uh, let, let the ideas uh, fly a little bit so it doesn't have to restrict it to the zero trust domain itself, but just maybe, you know, I'm also interested about the software resolved networks uh, paper at some point, uh, what you guys think about using DNS traffic for any other uh, than DNS traffic. So even if we can just talk about that, not particularly the zero DNS, it was already very beneficial, at least for me. <laughs> Uh, and whilst people are, are, are thinking, I'll just pop a link to the paper that uh, uh, so it gives more detail behind the presentation. I pop that uh, oh, in the chat as well. I mean, in terms of additional uses for the DNS, um, you might want to look at the recording of last week's call uh, levy, which P Peter uh, Lowe went through a number of uh, uh, imaginative, um, I think some would say slightly mad in a few instances uh uses of uh, uh, uh dns uh, there was certainly quite a, a wide variety um of uses um so that's well worth uh, to say that there's already lots of different ways people are uh, uh are taking advantage of the uh sort of dns um and again i'll for, for your and anybody else's benefit uh, uh, um, I'll put but then in did, the did, did, did Peter leave already or uh, is he here I saw him in the in the beginning but maybe I was too boring Peter must have dropped off momentarily uh so oh, yeah, uh, sure. you'll see a link to his rule 53 um uh, presentation where he uh, uh, gave a variety of examples of different uses of the uh um, uh, D DNS. So uh, um, I think he will be happy to add this to that. But but there are plenty of others out there. So uh, from from that point of view, um, lots of other people have already gone down this path. So there shouldn't be any objections in principle to doing this uh, levy because uh, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of other people that have, have done far more egregious uses of uh, 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 DNS th th than this one. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, um, as as far as just to see another comment uh, from from Tommy, that's probably uh, my fault uh, for for finding a, a place where the paper was accessible without uh, HTTPS. Um, <laughs> uh, there, there there certainly was at least one where it was behind HTTPS, but it also involved <laughs> a wall, which I didn't think people would thank me for uh, uh, <laughs> sharing that one. <laughs> I uh, didn't even know that the paper is there. This is a very old uh, website of an abandoned or already seized lab back in my other university, but I think the server is still online. So I just upload a lot of PDFs there because I still have access. Yeah, just, uh, <laughs> but thanks, for, thanks for pointing out. Yeah, it's not even, I'm talking about <laughs> encryption and zero trust and then sharing something on HTTP. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> yes. hey. yeah. I've got a question that just occurred to me, if now's hmm. the right time. Um, so if I understand the presentation correctly, whenever, if I'm using this service, whenever I want to access a particular 
corporate service that was identified by some DNS name. I make this query and in the response, as well as the IP address, I get back the token that I can use to authenticate with that service. Mm -hmm. um, so, is the, first of all, is that the right understanding? And secondly, does that mean that the uh, there is we have to think carefully about the how long that information is cached on the client? So exactly. the caching of the IP address as distinct caching of the token. You just pointed out something I, I wanted to hide. <laughs> oh no, I mean, I didn't want it to hide, but that's a very valid question. I will also address that. So first of all, your question is right. So every time you want to access, you have to do a DNS query. And the yeah. other thing that you mentioned is, is very typical, especially for zero trust environments. So while the domain name, even just one domain name entry, like an A record and an AA record, uh, can last for minutes or even hours, or if badly configured, then it can even last for days, right? Uh, uh, cached in 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 your uh, in your stub resolver, but while at the same time the zero trust tokens are probably for seconds and definitely not more than five minutes. So the way how we try to address this is that the tokens are also have a TTL, I would say. So then mm. how what is the what is the expiration time of the token? And uh, eventually, the, it doesn't matter how you configure the DNS, uh, I mean, the, the A records for your domains, it's always also modified during uh, crossings your DNS. So let's say your domain name has an expiry of like one day, but your tokens are for five minutes only. Then your DNS record will also modify to be reflected on this and your stub resolver. So then your domain name TTL and the, the acquisition token TTL will be always aligned. And then this is how we can force your token to, I mean, force your client to do the DNS lookup uh, every time your token is, is invalid. Of course, at some point, this can increase the network traffic because you have to ask more than normal, uh, but the domain name uh, cache and the TTL values are also not that high. So it might not uh, involve a lot of extra network traffic. And if you think about just the zero trust control plane traffic, you would anyway have that traffic. So just that now it is included in the DNS, uh, but the zero trust tokens will still expire within five minutes and you will still have to communicate with the zero trust control plays in every five minutes. Now we yes. just put everything into the DNS. So then you, you just increase your DNS uh, uh, query frequency, I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, that, that a, makes sense. It's a very nice and valid observation and point. So thanks for pointing that out. And do you have any plans for taking this forward? Um, is there an internet draft being created or for example? The, my plan was to consult with you guys first and then take it from there. <laughs> so okay. eventually when I presented this, I had the same questions as well that what, what is our purpose? Do we just want to jump this project? Are we going to commercialize it, release it? Or are we planning to, to talk to some industry people or standardization people to see how well it would be welcome? Uh, so first, I wanted to let you know guys about this and see what is your, uh, you know, your your message and, and how you interpreted it, and whether you you would think it makes sense at all, and then I can think about it whether it's uh, it's worth to to try to, you know, climb higher in the ladder. Mm. So well, I, I yeah, when I, I don't count myself as a security expert, so I'm I'm probably not qualified to <laughs> to advise, but yeah. I, I know some people who are. So uh, maybe some feedback uh, to follow up for, from the call uh, on, on that point. Uh, but it feels like it could be an interesting topic for perhaps a barb off or a hot RFC at uh, uh, the next ITF, uh, maybe just to uh, um, sort of circulate the idea more widely um, and, and uh, just get people thinking about it. But uh, see what feedback you get afterwards. I think uh, uh, Levy um, give people a chance to just sort of think about it for a few days and uh, come back to you. Sure, sure. If 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 sorry, if you still have some time, if Glenn can elaborate what he's uh, saying in his last comment, just in a couple of extra sentences, then I would be happy to listen to that. I'll do it verbally if it's okay. Cool. Sure. <laughs> um, you know, it, it just strikes me that the ECH negotiation. Um, that goes on within you know the TLS extensions now. Um, 
is essentially doing the same thing, right? It's reaching out to a, the DNS. It pulls out a, a, a thing. It then contacts a service that it presents that to and then proceeds to negotiate a session level effectively, you know, encryption protocol, but it's a set of keys that get exchanged that creates an authorization that could be used for authorization above and beyond the encryption path, right? So mm -hmm. while they're not exactly the same purpose, sort of the way they have to go about doing their, their negotiation, their exchange has similarities. And one could imagine even extending like the ECH negotiation to become like a, an access token for that service. Mm -hmm. If, yeah. if you see where I'm going with that. Right. Thanks. That's, that's a good point as well. And did you also mean by this comment that uh, even with the ECH negotiation, there is kind of like a heated debate at the IETF regarding why we are doing this or, uh, or is it just, or <laughs> is it just something you try to refer to that it might be a, can take the similar or the same path? Well, so there, there, there is some heated debate of, about the ECH at the ITF, um, but for different reasons, I think. I would say, though, that the problems and the challenges ECH has in getting it right and the threats it has, like a tax potential against it, would be similar to what would be uh, concerns and attacks potentially against what you've described. And so mm -hmm. the two of them, you know, share that sort of same attack surface and probably share probably some solution surfaces as well. So it's probably worth poking at if you haven't already looked at it to see where they've gone and particular design decisions they've made. I see. All right. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, uh, uh, Glenn. And uh, Kathleen, yes, there is a paper. Uh, if you bear with me, I will repost the link, um, which is further up in, in the chat, which... Uh, the one with HTTP only. <laughs> Yes, that, that one that's now uh, re reposted there. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, right, let, uh, close to the time. So let's draw a line there. Uh, Le Le Levy, as always, thank you for, for that. And particularly thank you for staying up so late to uh, uh, do it. Uh, I'd forgotten the challenges of uh, the uh, <laughs> four time zone, which make it even better. Um, and please, um, I'm sure people will come back to you um, with, with their more detailed thoughts once they've had a chance to uh, reflect on, on the presentation, this conversation, and also the paper. So I hope you'll get some useful chats, uh, sort of useful uh, input uh, as a result. But uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank Let you me... so much. Uh, one small question: So, will you repost these questions in the in the in the follow up email? So then I don't yes. have to copy yeah. paste it from the Zoom. Yes, there. I will. Yeah, yeah, I, I'll include wow. those. Uh, well, they'll be linked to with the, the link to the uh, recording as well. Um, All right, so... sure. Thank you so much. Um, much okay. Appreciated. You're most welcome. Right. Let's just uh, let me do a very quick uh, roundup, uh, just keeping an eye on the time. Um, so I won't go through the uh, sort of news headlines um, from this week, uh, other than say that there are less of them. Uh, a couple of interesting articles, uh, perhaps one on dynamic DNS in the middle of. Uh, uh, that page, uh, as well as the the one immediately below on the use of uh, sort of random capitals to uh, help fool potential uh, attackers trying to send you fake DNS replies. So, in my view, those are definitely worth reading if you have a moment. Um, also, a reminder: I realize there's a typo. ITF one sixteen. The early bird registration rate ends in a week's time. Um, Twenty three fifty nine UTC on the sixth of February. So, do bear that in mind if you're planning to um, register. Uh, that uh, that will be a saving if if you do so sooner rather than later. Uh, and and also the agendas for Nanog um, and OARC are now both available. Um, when we talk about those. Uh, think next week uh, on our call if i uh, remember rightly um and then just uh stepping through um i think no new additions that i've noted to uh the forthcoming event so i'll uh, sort of leave those there just a reminder if you're planning to put a paper in for apricot deadline for that is uh is today yeah in, in fact so uh, you'll need to do that uh, pretty soon if you've not already done so um, future call topics. Uh, yes, I was right. Next week we're going to talk about uh, uh, OARC and Nanog. 
Um, you see, you've got a few topics planned for the uh, sort of coming weeks. Um, uh, take us all the way through now, more or less, to uh, uh, ITF in Yokohama. Um, so we're a minute over the hour. Just quickly say, does anyone have any um, a brief, um, any other business that you would like to raise? I'll give you a moment to do so if you do. I'm not seeing anyone with their hand raised, um, so I think not. Uh, in which case, let's. Uh, so apologies for running over slightly, but I think that was a very useful presentation from uh, Levy. So Levy, thank you for your time. Thank you for the presentation. Um, thank you everyone for joining uh, this week. Um, have a fantastic week and uh, look forward to catching up uh, same time next week. And in the meantime, uh, I'll send out a bit later on, probably today, a link to the recording plus uh, slides, etc. And uh, uh, please get back to Levy with, uh, with um, any future thoughts. So thanks everyone and speak to you same time next week. Bye all. Thank you. Bye bye.